Welcome back to the Keto Naturopath on YouTube. Today we're gonna go into the roots of the problem of how to reverse the big fat lie about keto and the protein sparing modified fast. Specifically, we're gonna get into, go back into the omega-6 panel, get a larger context around it, what it affects, the larger picture on what it affects, what's associated with, and then how we're going to treat it. Just two steps. This is meant to be actionable information and I'm daring you to step up to go do it. We'll get to that in the end, okay? All right, reversing the big fat lie about keto and the protein sparing modified fast, including obesity and related disorders that have exploded over the last 60 years in two steps. Before we get into the how to change this, we really need to know the what in order to change this. My reason for going down this rabbit hole of details is to understand why this is. Of all the lab work I do on people, why was their high omega-6-3 panel such a consistent correlation to inflammation and other issues? It's been that way over decades. Finally time to look into it. So here's a context of some of the labs that we do. So when I'm talking about Looking at the omega panel, it is a very small piece that has a very high correlation, and it's always been that way. So finding out the why and how to treat it and what will it change is very important. Okay, so here's basically just the labs. I'm giving you a little bigger piece, and this is one of the panels that we use, actually two, you see another one below this, and then we do a hormone panel and genetic, uh, genomic analysis. And so, we have a real data-driven program to look into this. That wasn't an ad for the program. This is saying that the piece of data that we're looking at for this particular video is very small relative to this universe, if you will, okay? So here we go. Here's red blood cells, CBC, iron, white blood cells, yours, your lipid panel, everybody knows about thyroid, glucose, insulin, liver panel, kidney function, electrolytes, inflammation in general, vitamin D and carnitine, special homocysteine, so on and so forth. So what we're saying, this is the area we're looking at tonight. And these are a lot of the glucagon, vitamin D, IGF, all these other ones that are very helpful, but they don't have the same correlation that that panel does. So here's that little piece of labs that the Omega panel, that I've now have sorted this, so it's the upper left-hand corner is the highest amount. Just remember these numbers, roughly 17 to 18, depending on LabCorp has a slightly different value than Quest, but call it 17 plus 18, fairly high. And others are down as low as four. And notice the red. So there's a correlation, in the very least, notice the correlation with cholesterol. High omega-3, or sorry, high omega-6, linolenic acid, is low cholesterol. We'll get into that. So how we got here, the long-term consequences of the two studies, the Sydney Diet Heart Study 66 to 73 and the Minnesota Coronary Experiment, or survey some people call it, 1968 to 73. The, those conclusions were false, incomplete, you could even say fraudulent. Some people are really angry about it, call it a lie. Whatever, the conclusions were, and they were locked in for a better part of 50 years, began the obesity epidemic of today, and the Al Alzheimer's epidemic of today, and the diabetes epidemic of today, and the autoimmune, and it goes on and on, which can be reversed. Let's take a look. How our nutritional and cholesterol guidelines were created, how the two largest studies ever done at the time, 66 to 73, were misinterpreted and never publicly corrected never corrected. My analogy is you've been convicted of murder, wrongfully convicted of murder, and you're on death row. And while you're on death row, the original witnesses recant their testimony, and now there is no information against you, and yet the verdict does not change. What world does that exist in? What fair world does that exist in? So here we go, the two studies. So the original, when they American, the one in the U.S., used corn oil, which is slightly lower oleic acid, slightly lower omega-6. The one they did in, in uh, Australia was much higher, almost 80% omega-6. 
linoleic acid. Okay, so the original conclusions were, basically, you take polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-6, linoleic acid, it drops your cholesterol. Check, check. After that, they said, you know, there was no difference between the control and the treatment group. They were just undifferentiated. The only thing we can say, we dropped the cholesterol. Back then, that was a good thing because the whole idea was get the saturated fats out, bring in the polyunsaturated fats, and your cholesterol will go down, and you'll be healthier, and heart disease will go down. So first step, check, check, they got that. Took out the saturated fats, put in polyunsaturated fats, omega-6, linoleic acid, and we got a surprise. So th those conclusions stood for roughly 50 years until they were, it was discovered that there was some missing data, like a lot of missing data. There was a basement in Australia and a uh, garage box of data that was found in uh, Minnesota. And so the conclusions were revised and the new conclusions were pretty much the same, but with this one caveat. So it said, yes, you brought down the cholesterol level. Specifically, in the Minnesota study, brought it down 37 points. And they say for every 37 milligrams per deciliter you bring down, you increase the risk from all-cause mortality. So you drop the cholesterol, you increase the risk. Oops. You drop the cholesterol, you increase the risk. Huge difference. That also existed in the Australian study, except the Australian study. Now remember, they were using powerful, <laughs> they used a much more omega-6 because you're using safflower oil. So they said it increased, the results were yes, cholesterol dropped, but increased risk from all death, including coronary heart disease and cardiovascular disease. And obviously both, neither showed any benefit for cardiovascular no benefit for cardiovascular health condition. Okay, so after the studies were done, actually during the studies, obesity rates start to go up, up and up. People were getting out their saturated fats, bringing in their polyunsaturated fats. Another way of looking at it, it's pretty much iconic. This is the obesity epidemic curve. Again, somebody else sort of challenged the Ansel Keys way of looking at countries and this guy was uh, Hunslar, 1912, and he put together his study showing that countries with highest saturated fats had the lowest coronary heart disease. The basis for the nutritional and lipid guidelines that we use today as international standards was on, based on incomplete and possibly fraudulent data. Some people call it a blatant lie. That became the law of the land, if not the law of the earth. The review of the two studies and how their misinterpretation came to be the bedrock of nutrition in the West was over the next 50 years. Major mistake. Here's one of the studies, the Sydney Diet Heart Study, and it was reviewed by and reconstituted and re-examined and reconcluded by Dr. Chris Ramson. Three years later, he did the same one, the Minnesota. So when the first one went off in 2013, they go, oh, well, Everybody makes mistakes. And there's this other study out there, the Minnesota one, that still hasn't been changed. Three years later, when that was changed, the only two studies in which the United States and hence the rest of the world has based their nutritional guidelines on have been completely changed. The conclu conclusions are not even related. And yet, they haven't been corrected in the public's eye. There's been no comment by the existing institutions, pharmace pharmaceutical companies, the food industry companies, uh, the major uh, educational institutes like Harvard. So the timeline of the crime perpetrated on so many in so many different countries, for two generations, many of us followed these dietary guidelines. And for two generations, many people were put on medications. Okay, here's the bigger picture. Way back in 58, you had the seven country study by Ansel Keys. That's not where I'm going. This is the focus of why this has not changed public policy at all, at all. That's why we are now living in an age in which you have to take care of yourself. It's up to you to change your health, not your doctor, because you're depending on what your doctor knows and doesn't know, man or woman doctor. Okay, so we have these two studies were done in 73. 
And in 77, the McGovern report came out, which is the basis for, this is a big report came out, I'm waiting for it, he says, yep, this is it, we got it locked down, these two studies are absolutely wonderful, and he based it on that. They based it on it. It's funny that McGovern's from Minnesota as well. And so Kesey's from Minnesota as well. National Cholesterol Education Program came out in 1980, which is an extension of the report in 77. So after 2016, after the second study was reconstituted, reconcluded, reevaluated, and the conclusions were very different, there's a line in the sand saying, well, after that, we need to re revise something. We need to, you know, we have to bring in, you know, the witnesses have recanted. What we made our conclusions on no longer holds. So what happened then? Two things happened. You had more um, publications coming out saying, oops, I think we made a mistake. And, and that's good. But at the same time, you also had a big uh, information war. The, the Harvard and so on and so forth writing bogus papers saying, nope, things haven't changed, it really doesn't matter, you know, those studies really weren't worth that much. And on it goes. So the truth was now glaringly obvious. Both studies show that lowering saturated fats and increasing omega-6 linolenic acid increased all-cause mortality. Increased all-cause mortality, death from any reason. Here's another way of looking at the guidelines. Here's where the study was done, and notice how during the study, soybean oil just skyrockets as a uh, consumer. And here's the 1977 report by McGovern, which leads to the 1980 Health Initiative Guidelines. Here we go, there's the 1980, and then again in 85, and then again in 90, and then again in 95. There's the report. And so it all began. The Select Senate Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs also known as the McGovern Report in 1977, rolled out its first of multiple national guidelines, which became the catalyst for the ensuing obesity epidemic in the U.S. There again, there's the same iconic curve. It's unbelievable that there's an event so closely correlated to this particular outcome. This is not the crime, however. These nutritional guidelines were created for the right reasons. There was a lot of starvation going on in the United States at that time. Just based, it was just based on faulty information. That's not a crime. So in science, when a study is done and they find out something went wrong, they redo the study. And until the point you can redo the study and get the same results done in two different locations by following the same sequence for that study, so that's what they did in Australia and the United States. We got two studies going on at the same time, and guess what? They had the same conclusion. Well, shazam. So chronology matters. After 1916, after the two studies were re-examined, re-evaluated, reconstituted, the volume of disinformation noticeably increased. In essence, it became a trigger for a disinformation war. Kind of like what's going on now with the vaccine. You're either with it or against it, on one side or the other. And so this disinformation war was in medicine, and it was in the food industri industry. And this is, in essence, the medical archaeologist, uh, Dr. Ramiston, at the NIH, who put these two studies together and reconstituted them. The crime is that nothing changed after it was revealed twice that replacing saturated fat with omega-6, linolytic acid, was a catastrophic mistake. It was a catastrophic mistake for the world in general. Anybody that used the U.S. national guidelines, anything that came out of the McGovern report. This is just a few days before that second release in 2006. I'm sure they caught wind of it. But uh, this article, by the way, was referred to somebody that commented in the uh, YouTube. I really appreciate it. I can't remember his name. So I, I followed it up. It's just a nice rendering of the history of the mess from a non-American perspective. This is from the UK perspective, and it basically said, oops, <laughs> in 1980, long after, after long consultation of some of America's most senior nutrition scientists, the US government issued its first dietary guidelines from the McGovern Report. And then in 83, the UK government issued advice closely, followed the American, and so on, and basically it was about cut back on saturated fats because of the cholesterol. 
lower, lower your cholesterol and die sooner. All right, here's some of the disinformation. Walter Willett from Harvard's School of Public Health. He was interviewed specifically on how is this affect future going forward. He goes, well, I don't see any reason to change anything. I, I got my million dollars every year, so I don't know. I just think it's very corrupt and um, that's unfortunate. So what were some of the changes that happened from 1970 to 2014? The obvious one, seed oils, vegetable oils. And you could say what else went up? Sugar went up a little bit. In terms of macros, carbs up, saturated fats down, fat in general was down. The oils we were using were skyrocketing and primarily soy, and then along came canola oil in the uh, late 70s and 80s, and now it's soy, canola from Canada, and corn. Okay, again, this is the canola coming in. What did I say? Coming in, yep, the late 80s into the 90s, and it's probably even higher now. It's, it's the cheapest oil you can get. Some people call it the poor man's olive oil. I think it's the poor man's poor health oil. This is, I've shown you this before, and this is a list of oils just so you get to know this. I think it's not an insurmountable list, it's just be aware of, hey, first of all, you know you can Google it. Go on and Google it and you go, I can think for myself. This is the whole activity here. I can think for myself, find out there's canola oil. How much polyunsaturated fat does it have? It has about 30%, 29. Some of that's gonna be ALA and some of that's gonna be linoleic acid. The rest is Oleic acid, and the reason they call it the poor man's olive oil is like match it up to olive oil. See, olive oil has 75% oleic acid, monounsaturate, also known as omega 9, and small amount of polyunsaturated and a small amount of saturated. And it's historically, and it's just a squeezed oil. It's been squeezed for thousands of years, as has flaxseed oil. And by the way, the root word of linolenic acid, linol linoleic acid comes from lin, as in linseed, as in linen, comes from flax. So that's where it was first isolated was from flax. Okay, another look at it. What this does, these two colors here, the orange and the darker orange, are the two different polyunsaturated fats. So it's alpha linolenic acid, which is the omega-3. We'll talk about that some later in another video. And the blue is a linoleic, which is what we're talking about today. Chronology matters. So before those two studies were examined, it was not any, it was not common to have a voice saying, you know, I think those are bogus. <clears throat> we need to um, revolt. <laughs> we need to have our own studies. There were people that were doing some studies on this, but they were minor um, in comparison. There was such a, a global government control on this is how we're gonna do it. This is what the doctors are gonna say. This is what nutritionists are gonna say is what the, health pro the food products are gonna have. And so that's, and the pharmaceutical companies, they're all locked in. Okay, so therefore the international compliance of the two documents was maintained, or was it? Those who dared to speak out in that era are, are really huge people, and I'm gonna introduce you to one. The nutritional guidelines were terribly flawed, and the studies that were based on were flawed, were revealed as being incorrect. And some people knew that. They were just being squelched out. They're being, uh, voices being smothered, so to say. This is one person who spoke out. She was a Greek-born, American-educated uh, MD who studied lipids, who studied uh, fatty acids, and she founded a charitable, I'm sure I'm looking for it now, she founded a charity, education charity in Washington based on health and genetics and her work on uh, lipids. And she had a different perspective. Her perspective was, let's get real, that is not right. She came out with two books, or one book and then a subsequent book of the same thing in 97, 99. And I'm gonna give you some of her conclusions. And so this is a big deal. It was about the time I was graduating. I was just hearing about this. Um, but it was, looking back, it was phenomenal. She worked at, um, her focus was on nutritional aspects of genetic and endocrine disorders and the evolutionary aspect of diet and fatty acids, especially about the balance between the six and the three. She was talking about the balance of the essential fatty acids of six and three, way ahead of anybody else. Okay, here's some of her conclusions, very actual information that you can just jump on. So taking omega-3, call it fish oil, for short term may not be effective. 
unless you address your omega-6 polyunsaturated fats in the diets. So if you're going to take some omega-3, you better know how much omega-6 you have. How big of a problem do you have? And do you have any idea where those sources are coming from? If you don't have any idea, you're not going to be able to change those sources. So you're just not going to smother that source by taking omega-3. Her second point is taking omega-3 long-term may be ineffective, may not work at all if the dose isn't high enough. Three, the benefit when achieved by the omega-3, pushing it back into normal ratios, would be lost if the dose isn't high enough. Okay? And also omega-3, and she's the first to say this, that the marine origin is a lot more potent than the plant origin. So omega-3, EPA, DHEA is the marine origin, and ALA, alpha linolenic acid, is found in vegetables. So many chronic conditions, cardiovascular diseases, diabetics, cancer, obesity, autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, depression are associated with a lot of inflammatory prostaglandins. Get into that in another video later. Um, just to cite, suffice it to say, here's the correlation of having such a tilted omega-6 to omega-3 with these particular conditions. Her advice continues, increase all these conditions, all these bad conditions will be increased by increases of omega-6 fatty acid intake. You keep doing what you're doing, you're going to get worse. And it will decrease by increases of omega-3, either ALA or EPA or DHA. So you're saying ALA, plant-based omega-3, has some effect. It's not as potent as fish oil. EPA and DHA are far more potent. Most studies use those when they're doing their studies. The optimal range is what everybody asks. The optimal range of omega-6 to 3 is 1 to 1 or to 4 to 1, depending on the disease. Therefore, it is essential to decrease the omega-6, decrease the omega-6 while increasing the omega-3 in prevention and management of chronic diseases. Furthermore, the balance of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acid, 6 to 3 fatty acids is very important for health. The ratio is really the determinant of health in her perspective. The ratio of omega-6 to 3, which is kind of the search that I've been after. What about this? This is like such a weird ratio. It's really screwed up for a lot of people. The ratio of omega-6 to 3, essential fatty acid is important in determining, determining health. Back to that panel that I showed you. This is the thing that it's like, how can this little piece of real estate on all the labs that I do within all the other panels that I do be so valuable, be so so not just valuable, but something you can act on. You can change that number by taking one supplement, but you better be measuring. So when people ask these questions, how much of this should I take? If I eat pork, should I take? If I eat chicken, should I take? My answer, my answer is you go get tested for all $35, maybe 50, even if it was 100, go get tested once or twice a year and adjust it until you now can find out, all right, it's because I eat this stuff or that stuff. I don't know if it's por you know, pork and chicken, which are basically fed corn and soy um, seeds. And so they more than likely and have been alleged to have higher omega-6. And if you're eating all that, you'll have higher omega-6 too. But if that was the only bad thing you're doing, I'm not quite sure you're going to pop out of the ideal range. I don't think it's, you're not going to be way up to 18. 18, 17, 18, 19, 20, the American population is because of processed foods. And for those who cook at home, cooking and crap. And when you go out to eat, you can bet they're cooking in canola oil or soy oil. They're not cooking in coconut oil or olive oil. This is the reality of our omega-6 to 3 ratios today. They're high, wicked high, from Dr. Simopoulos. So the omega-6 to 3 ratio imbalance is associated with heart attacks, stroke. So a heart attack is really, and a stroke are the same thing. Here's your clot in your head. Here's your clot in your heart. It's the same cause, just two different locations. Cancer, obesity, insulin resistance, diabetes, asthma, arthritis, lupus, depression, schizophrenia, ADHD, postpartum, depression, Alzheimer's, basically metabolic chaos. The disinformation still continues today as if nothing happened. What? What? 
What reconstitution of these? What studies were those again? It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Here we go. Excess linoleic acid. So excess omega-6, excess linoleic acid is associated with depression, obesity, cardiovascular diseases, and cerebrovascular diseases. Fish oil, or D EPA, DHA deficiency, which you can measure, is associated with obesity, depression, dementia, Alzheimer's, MS, and chronic inflammatory conditions of pretty much any disorder. So what is the ideal ratio of omega-6 to 3? It's 1 to 1, 4 to 1. Stay under 4 to 1, 6 to 3. Just do it. Measure it. Figure it out. Do it. It's not that difficult. We are an era in which your health is, the onus of your health and changing your health is on you. Everybody else is a coach trying to give you some good information, but not like the good old days where we thought people actually had the answer. Not quite sure which is better, but right now it's on your shoulders and trying to give you some clean information so you can act on it, so you can change your life. So the two steps to reverse this, first one we've talked all about, address your 6-3 imbalance, identify where your 6 is coming from, mitigate it with omega-3, get tested a couple times a year. The other is absolutely march on towards a protein-sparing modified fast of whole food, natural foods, of whole food sources. And if that's too much for you, head towards the ketogenic diet and learn about that. It's not that complicated. These are not scientific diets. They've been around for nearly over 100 years. Well documented out. Feel free to look into my other videos, and I'll put a link here to a playlist all about PSMF. And you can even go back and find the history and evolution of the ketogenic diet as well. So moving in this direction is what you have to do. Till next time. Go do it.